Welcome to Water and Climate. We're here with Zach Weiss of Water Stories. Zach, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you, Hart? Doing great, thanks. So, Zach, you have a, a presentation for us. So why don't you just go into that, and then we'll do some questions. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, so just nice, quick, short presentation here to just um, kind of set the stage. And, you know, I, I call this presentation Water Stories. That's the online community that we're setting up. And it's really about my most hopeful vision for the future. Um, and in this most hopeful vision, humans decide to change our relationship with water and with nature. And I think that's a really important underlying current of all of this work. It's something that if we don't address, we're bound to get the other work wrong as a result. Uh, and with that understanding comes the understanding that water is the lifeblood of the earth. It is the living element and the supporting element to all of life on this planet. And so we can see this in the full water cycle and how it functions, how it draws water through the earth's continents. Uh, you know, we have sun lifting, turning that liquid water into vapor, that water vapor drifting inland. Then in order for it to actually form clouds and then rain, it needs a precipitation nuclei to form around. Uh, one of the main ones being hygroscopic microorganisms produced within the stomatal cavities of trees. And then something really important as you get that phase change from very voluminous to very small, you actually get a change in pressure. And so it acts like a vacuum. And so this is the biotic pump. It slowly is, brings this conveyor belt of moisture through the planet's continents. And then when that rain hits nice, sheltered, shaded, cool, and slightly moist soil, like a moistened sponge, it just soaks it all right up. And so it infiltrates rapidly, feeds into the ground, recharges aquifers, comes back as springs, creeks, and rivers. So we have this healthy, steady flow of water, a cycle of water from the oceans through the land. And then there's also the smaller cycles of water happening on land, which are very important as well. But increasingly through human activity, we've created this watershed death spiral where we've hardened landscapes, we've destroyed the forest, we've drained the wetlands, we've turned those into our arable soils, we've cracked open those soils, we've exposed them to wind, to heat, to all of these forces that then make them very hard. And so when that rain does come, it's not able to infiltrate. If you imagine a dry sponge doesn't infiltrate any water at first, it actually has to be cooled down and hydrated a little bit. And so you get all of this flooding but then because you have the flooding, you also have the drought. Those are two sides of the same coin. And then with long persistent drought, you then get these big horrific fires. Uh, but not just that, as you have this hot air rising up off of all of these exposed barren landscapes, you have these high pressure domes that are actually pushing against the force of that incoming air. You have energy moving from the land into the ocean, charging up those storm cells so that you get bigger, stronger flooding events with longer periods of drought in between. Uh, and so this is a feedback loop. As we dehydrate landscapes, those landscapes get less rain, created more flooding, more drought, and you get more and more of this the further down this path you go. And so this is what those two situations look like when you're looking at water flow over time. In the concrete landscape, this is the same amount of water, but you have all of the flow happening all at once most of its runoff, and then very quickly that landscape's dry, there's no photosynthesis, there's no productivity. And so you have this erosion, you have risk, you have costs associated with those, then you need to insure against both of those. And then you have finance charges on top of that. And then because you've designed the flood, you've also designed the drought and the fire with those set of erosion, risk, cost. And it's just this situation that's not viable. And when you compare that to the full water cycle, where you still have some runoff, but a lot more infiltration and a lot less runoff, what happens is that water can slowly move through the system. So you have less high peak flows and a much longer time for photosynthetic cooling to take place. Water is absorbing 590 calories of heat energy for every gram that's converted from a liquid to a vapor. And then those trees are actually really moving that water and that heat energy up higher into the atmosphere, where then if it recondenses, it then releases that energy um, in this specific wavelength that really gets out of 
our atmosphere as well. So this is what that looks like on the land. And you can see really clearly how these two landscapes are gonna handle water entirely differently. This is New York City, Manhattan, under indigenous stewardship and under colonial stewardship. And in the indigenous stewardship, everything has a role and a place, and we're all part of the same connected, interconnected whole. In the colonial perspective, everything is a resource with energy to exploit. We're all separate. And so it's this system where we've actually, through colonialism, tricked people to extract and destroy their own landscapes for the wealth of others, the accumulated wealth of others. So it's this real travesty. And we see it's putting our communities in crisis. It's creating the floods. It's creating the droughts. It's creating the fires. And then through that, you have refugee crises. You have migration crises. You know, situations like Syria and the situation along the southern U.S. border don't happen without desertification, forcing people off of their landscapes. And so this has happened all around the world. One third of Earth's land over the last 10,000 years, starting in the Fertile Crescent and the Levant about 10 to 12,000 years ago, and then spreading through Asia, through Africa, through Australia, through the American West, and they're trying hard in South America right now. But this is something we can reverse. We have this legacy, we have this potential for destruction, but we also have the power to change this and move in a really positive direction. Uh, and so we can transform these watersheds that we've created into water catchments. We, in so many situations, are making our water just drain away and feed into the oceans. And we can turn those into water catchments where that life-giving force of water actually is absorbed by the earth, fed into the earth, and feeding the living biotic systems of this planet. And so this is exactly what we're focused on at Water Stories, training people to transform water sheds into water catchments. So we just did our launch yesterday. You can join the community at community.waterstories.com. And there we're gonna have all of our content. So we have our water cycle animations online right now. And over the next two months, we'll be releasing every week a new bit of video content, a new film, uh, all leading up to a course where we're really aiming to train practitioners for water restoration. So this is some of what's possible. This is a project in Portugal where they have long dry periods, heavy rains when they come, but so they're basically in the situation of either flood or drought. So there's a community that didn't have enough water. And then this is the water retention landscape that was created there. So this is only with the water from the sky, collecting, storing it seasonally throughout the year. And this community has gone from not having enough water not knowing if they could even stay on that landscape because it was so desertifying to now having abundant water and having a thriving community. And so that's the work of Sepp Holzer, my mentor. This is his farm in Austria, another incredible example, the Kramaterhof, where he created this network of 72 interconnected ponds and water bodies. And on this mountainside farm that was thought to be barren and pretty useless, low value garbage farmland, he created this Garden of Eden, where they produce an immense amount of crops every year. They only harvest those that do the best. Uh, and is this really incredible example of how farms can also be abundant, vibrant ecosystems that help the landscape as a whole, where wildlife can feed and forage, where insects can regain their populations. And so it's a really incredible example of what farming could do when we do it right, when we do it in harmony with nature and with water. Another example, Rajendra Singh, another mentor in India, where they've actually revived rivers. They've revived seven rivers, some of which were dry for decades, and now they have perennial flow. And they did it all with the same thing, with decentralized water retention, holding water in the earth. So Rajendra was actually a doctor treating people for night blindness. And one of the elders said, if you want to help our village, don't give us medicine, give us water. So that's what he started doing. And you can see these before and afters where, you know, this is a community that is able to do nine hectares of agriculture. And after one water body, they went to 650 hectares. So they paid for the cost of this water body four times over the first year in their increase in agricultural productivity. So these are things that really pay for themselves quickly in a timeline that makes sense. After the first rainy season, you see impacts from your work. And so in this community, they went from having to flee, having to migrate to other areas, looking for work, to now they can 
live here again. They have abundant farmland. They have land that they can work with that their animals can find forage in. And this also creates a really big impact in the quality of life, especially for young girls. Situations like this, young girls are staying home from school to help the mothers carry water when water is far away. When you bring water to these communities, now the young girls are going to school again because they don't have to spend all day schlepping water back and forth. Uh, so it really causes this trickle effect of cascades where you have more peace, you have more prosperity, you have more gender equality, all from working with water. So we have this water in the ground, but we also have this atmospheric water that regulates so much of our Earth's temperature. And it really provides our, our best window to be able to do something about all of the crises we're facing. You look at the Amazon, for example, and as we clear the Amazon, we create more pressure in the Hadley cell in the Atlantic, creating more storms and hurricanes in other regions. Not only that, but then if we desertify the Amazon, people in the southern parts of the continent are no longer going to receive consistent rainfall. So we see this very clearly with the American West. You look at California is this break in the biotic pump that has, as a result, aridified the mountain West. Um, and we're seeing the same thing present day in the Amazon. So it's really important that we recognize how interconnected we are and how we all need to start working together if we're going to really achieve this goal of restabilizing and rebalancing our climate. So this is everything that we're focused on with water stories. I'd love for any of you guys watching this to come join us, come experience what we're offering. And uh, we really hope this can be a benefit to the community as large because, you know, right now it's just too little. It's happening on these little islands, but it is happening all around the world. So what we want to do is start weaving a web where all these people that are engaging in this water work can learn from one another, can teach one another, can engage with one another. And together we can get really strong. For example, these projects in India had a lot of problems with the government. Rajendra was under house arrest with 72 legal cases against him, but because the communities came together and acted collectively, they were able to overcome those challenges. Uh, and so it's really with the way all of our political policy regulatory systems are in place, it's only by coming together, setting our differences aside and saying, do you want a good viable future? Do you want water for your children? Let's set all of these divisive issues that are currently dividing us aside and let's work together to do something really positive for ourselves, for our landscape and for the future generations that will inherit the earth. Uh, thank you, Zach. I have a few questions if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. how, how did you get interested in water? Tell us your story. Yeah, I mean, you know, I always loved nature. I grew up next to a thousand acres of forest that I could just wander into whenever I want to. So I was always playing in the springs and the creeks. And um, I always wanted to do something that put me outside, that put me doing something that would help nature. So I pursued outdoor education and then that moved into a gardening business, a greenhouse business. But it was all still very unfulfilling in the sense of I was only providing solutions for the richest, wealthiest people, really. And they had all these embodied costs, plastic, metal, and even the very best greenhouse is only going to last 100 years. And if no one maintains it for one month, everything in it is dead. Um, and so then in 2012, I came across Sepp Holzer and he came to Montana for a workshop. I attended the workshop, ended up working for the project just to make things happen. And that was kind of my foot in the door. I always tell people, if you want to impress a farmer, just work harder than everyone else. Uh, it's not that hard actually to do if you're driven to do so. And that's the way to impress somebody that, that you're trying to you know, engage in some kind of mentor relationship. Uh, so that started a three-year and even five-year apprenticeship timeline of bringing people uh, to Austria for workshops and then bringing SEP to America for both for English speaking workshops, eventually started working on projects with them in different areas around the world. And um, then, you know, really around, I don't know, 2013 or so moved into this work full time, left the greenhouse business. And it's just, we can make such a bigger change for such less money, less input that lasts so much longer. Uh, so why wouldn't I put my energy into these things? 
So tell us about your work on the ground. It's my understanding that you, you designed water retention and landscape. Uh, can you tell us more about your the work you're currently doing? Yeah, yeah. So we design and implement. And I think that's one of the big things that sets us aside is that we actually know how to do these things to implement the projects. Um, you know, nothing against designers, but if you don't have the hands-on experience to understand the fine differences between 35% clay and 45% clay, just by the sense of feeling it, you're not going to be able to design something that's really in tune with that landscape. Um, so what we do is really offer help anywhere along the process, but we come in, we help people understand their goals in terms of quality of life and their landscape. And then we figure out the ways to best harmonize those two things, um, to take what they're trying to accomplish on that landscape and what that landscape already is and has been for a long time. And then what are the interventions we can make to help align those and set up that property to use its natural resources as best as it can. So it's benefiting as much as possible from the rain, as much as possible from the sun, as much as possible from the wind, using all of these forces to sometimes it's just to have a beautiful landscape where there's lots of wildlife. Sometimes it's to have an education center or a demonstration center. Sometimes it's to have a family homestead, sometimes to have a production farm, sometimes to have a whole community living on these landscapes. Um, but so we really come in, help develop a concept plan for what can be done with water on that landscape. Uh, you know, it could be anything from treating the soil biology to building water bodies and water retention features, depending on the context of the project. And then we come back for various phases of work to actually help people implement those projects. Um, so on our, you know, longest standing projects, we've gone back every year for five or six years now, every year doing another phase of the installation uh, to the point where, you know, that project now has, I don't know, 20 or 30 water bodies. Um, whereas we started very small, now we're slowly expanding our work as they see that it's just really effective for their landscape. So it's my understanding that you have ambitious goals for training and engaging people over the next three years and beyond. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, definitely. I, the, there is so much work in this field, and most people don't even know that they want it yet. Um, and so it's something that I can't possibly service. And I remember talking with Sepp one time, and he said, you know, you're all well and good, but we need thousands of you. Millions would be better. And so that really stuck with me. And that's now what I'm trying to create with Water Stories, where we really train people to create a livelihood where they're earning their living by doing something for water, by doing something for land. So many times people have to work some job that they don't believe in or they actually hate to do something that they care about in their off time. So what we're trying to do is create a platform where people can learn all of the skills that I have, the tools that I need to do my daily job, and then take them on to themselves see what fits and what works right. We're not trying to make everyone do exactly what I do. There's so many things we can do to heal the water cycle. What we're trying to do is prepare people to actually engage in a vocation where they're earning their living, doing the things that they care about. So whether that's treating the soil, treating the waters, anything in between, um, we want to empower people with the ways of reading the landscape, the ways of understanding what's possible, the history of the landscape, but then how to do these things, how to create actions that have ripple effects, how to engage with mentors, how to build skills, and how to advocate within your community, and then eventually how to make a business out of this as well, where it's, you know, you need to know how to estimate or bid a project, how to work with clients, all these diverse skill sets that I've been fortunate to gain from different mentors over the years. We're trying to wrap that all up into one bundle so that people can digest that and then enact it in their own life. So how soon will people be able to engage in the course that you're describing? Uh, how long uh, do you envision the course being? And will people have to leave their homes to travel somewhere to take the course? Yeah, all great questions. So the core course will open the last two weeks of May. We'll do something a little bit different where we don't just have the course open for anyone to buy in at any time. It's an online course, 
but an at home in the ground course in the sense of the teachings are online, but then every module has an action or a series of actions and activities you actually have to do in the landscape in order to enact and learn what you need to progress to the next module. Um, so we'll start our whole first cohort all together, June 1. June 1 will basically close the course. No one else can get in at that point and we'll start all together. So we can kind of move through these modules more or less in sync. Um, and it's a 12 module course. You know, I think most people will spend, I think really driven people will spend between six months and one year to do the course and really to gain everything they can from it. Um, but it is going to have some element of being self-directed, where if you want to go through it even quicker and you're completing the activities, you're doing the things, you'll be able to. Um, so I think someone who, you know, they're just focusing on this one thing, maybe they complete it in two or three months, um, whereas other people that have life going on might even spend a year or two working through all of the different modules and pieces of the course. It sounds like a wonderful uh, mix of like it's flexible, it's hands-on, um, you can do it from home, but you're going to get sounds like, uh, you know, personal guidance and that kind of thing. Definitely, definitely. And I'll say I hate online courses. <laughs> <laughs> I hate them. I hate them. I've had so many people try and get me to do them. And I've just said, no, 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 I don't believe in that. I don't believe we can actually teach this stuff in that way. Um, and now that I've got a decade of experience in the field, that I've spent years training up apprentices and getting that experience, and that we're building this custom, very interactive platform for the course itself, um, it gives me the confidence to pursue this because we're going to make something very high quality. It's not going to be like your normal online course where it's some person sitting in front of a whiteboard for an hour at a time. It's going to have real visuals of projects happening, animations to get concepts across. Um, we're really pulling out all the stops and investing everything we can into making this course as high quality as we can so that it really gets the pieces across. Um, and then, you know, of course, there's going to be things that <clears throat> still will help to have in-person trainings. And so that's something we'll do down the road. Essentially, we'll have everyone go through the online at-home course first. And then when we come together for in-person courses, we can move people really far. We're not trying to explain what the key or the core trench of a dam is. They already know that. And we can go through the details of how to feel, how to create, how to do things on, on scale, on budget, on timeline. Um, so that's kind of the, the more long-term vision we have here. Let's just take a minute to see if I, any of our other guests have questions for you. Christy Carey or Classy, do you have any questions for Zach? I just got in here. I had a heck of a time getting in. So um, mm, Really? Yeah, well, it wasn't your default. It was, you know, internet stuff and I rebooted my computer and it just wasn't cooperating. It happened. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what he said. So um, I'll keep listening though. Okay. <laughs> uh, Zach, you want to tell us a little bit about your rollout yesterday? Tell us about the content you've created. Um, yeah. I know you're, you've been incubating content and uh, it, it's, it's exciting to have it. Uh, I know the animations are wonderful. They're very instructive. Yeah. It teaches concepts that you wish everybody knew about water, but we don't learn. But with any luck, more and more people will be learning, you know, how water really works and, and that kind of thing. But tell us about the content that you've created. Yeah, and I'll actually uh, share my screen here just for a minute so that we can see the timeline. So We've been filming for four years now. Started as a documentary film way back. We filmed with a lot of incredible people around the world. And so we're just starting to sift through and get this content digestible and in a way that we can get it to the public. So one of our first films will be Desert or Rainforest. We'll release the trailer for that next week and we'll release the full film on March 16th. This is a project about Walter Yenny uh, in the Canberra National Botanical Gardens where they created a rainforest. It wasn't a rainforest previously, but by storing and cycling the water and getting that water cycle kickstarted and then working with the forest, they have now generated a rainforest climate where even when 
it's 110 degrees in the control site, the area where they did nothing, it's a nice cool 70 or 80 degrees within this forest. So it really is an awesome test site and example of what's possible, how we really can cool the planet by engaging the power of plants, by engaging the power of water. Um, so that'll be our first big film on the 16th. We also have two shorts, uh, an under 10 minute and under 20 minute version. It's kind of our plea to the world, hope in a world of crisis and water Earth's blood. And it very much goes into how to make these changes and why they're necessary, why the human activities that our ancestors have engaged in have put us in a cycle of flood, drought, and fire, and how we move away from that. And Water Earth's Blood goes a little bit deeper into how important this vital resource is for life and what happens when we drain it away from our landscapes and what happens when we hold it in the landscapes. Um, that'll lead up to our next trailer and eventually the next film called Reviving Rivers. This is featuring Rajendra Singh in these projects in India where they've revived seven rivers, restored 250,000 wells, they've reduced the temperature two degrees Celsius, impacting more than a million people, causing the reverse migration. Um, then we'll also release a very short one minute video, a hydrograph animation, um, uh, basically along the lines of what I explained previously, but with the moving element where you actually see the flow of water in this hydrograph. Uh, we'll also have a founding member launch towards the end of April. Basically people who know they wanna buy on for the course, know they wanna buy into our membership, will have an opportunity to buy in early at a discounted rate. Um, we'll then release a film about Sepp Holzer. This is a short film about eight minutes long called Sepp Holzer, A Renatured Life. And we'll then release a much longer film about Sepp in the second half of the year. Um, and then our core course will open for people to buy into May 18th. It'll close on the 31st and we'll all start together on June 1st. Um, so this is just the start of the content we have coming out. We'll keep releasing films. We have lots of, lots of footage in the hopper, so to speak. Uh, but these are the pieces that we have ready to get out to the public so far. Okay, any, any more questions? Zach, you're really doing great work. Uh, you're very organized. I'm uh, surprised. I'm, uh, Classy has raised her hand. Uh, so if you can unmute yourself, Classy, then uh, please ask your question. Uh, yes, good morning. Um, I, I'm really interested in all of this because I think my uh, part of the world really needs it. Um, I would like to know if in the future um, you guys are thinking about coming to Asia to do some on uh, on site training at all, uh, because like from here going to the Americas, going to other countries is sometimes hard because of visa issues. Uh, if 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 we join the course and we need some extra help, would it be at some time maybe available in the Asia region? Yeah, and I imagine eventually having these classes around the world, really. Um, I know that we do have a project in China that we'll do sometime over the next year or two. There's a possibility that that has some workshop element added to it. Um, I will be doing some workshops in Europe towards the end of this year. I have more projects coming up down the road in Australia, so probably we'll be doing projects there down the road. Um, what I will probably start doing more and more is really trying to push some of my implementation projects to also develop a course element so that as I'm going around the world doing projects, I'm also teaching people in those locations how to do them for themselves. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for joining. Okay, I think that's all of our time. Zach, uh, you're doing great work and uh, you, you have unlimited opportunity, I mean, unlimited uh, there are no limitations on you posting whatever you want to the Water and Climate Facebook group. It's just, this is really, you know, you're, it's not only the core of our mission, but you, um, you extend it and, uh, and, and you really, to me, you're expanding everybody's idea of what's possible and um, really appreciate your work. So 
Oh, thank you. I really appreciate you saying that. And, you know, One last I, thing. Go, go ahead. Oh, I just, you know, I think more than anything, it's really just being the messenger. We have all of these amazing projects all around the world that just no one knows about. And so that's really why we started Water Stories, to get these stories out there so that we can develop this new mythology that, yes, we know humans can destroy, but humans can also enhance, create, repair, mm -hmm. we heal. We have all of these abilities as well. Right. I like saying that, you know, it's not so much, not everybody has to agree with this. It's not so much how many people there are. It's, it's whether each person has a, is a net negative or a net positive, you know, human beings can absolutely, you know, be a blessing to the, uh, to the earth around them. There's this quote by Robin Wall Kimmerer, the land is waiting for a time when it can be grateful for the people, <laughs> you know? So, um, uh, I wanted to, okay, repeat again how people can contact you. What, what do you want them to access online? And also, is there a way for people to contribute financially? Yeah, um, great question. So the ways to find us would be waterstories.com. And then our community platform is community.waterstories.com. And there you can join, you'll have access to all the videos and the community. Um, you know, the currently to date, this has all been funded out of my own pocket, which is uh, getting very burdensome, especially as we've made zero income. And I've been you know, funding this for four years now as my own pet project. So we don't have a good way set up for other people to help contribute, but we do want to do that in the future, certainly. Um, really, our core course and our membership is going to be the first way. And if enough people sign on to that, that'll give us the resources we need to keep making films. Um, and then we will also do some kind of, we're not clear exactly on how it'll work, but we'll do some kind of stakeholder membership where people who believe in this kind of thing can say, I want to contribute X dollars a month. And then they get some special bonus package uh, as our appreciation. Sounds great. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having this platform and for starting the conversation in water and climate and for having me here and everything you do as well. Really appreciate it. it it's my pleasure. Uh, so long, everybody. Cheers. Thank I'm, you, everybody. I, Zach, I'll give you a buzz in a minute. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers.